below you over 3,000 amazing people and the 83% who have yet to subscribe. Today we're going to be jumping into the Daughters of Cain and seeing how they're going to be faring in 4th edition. <laughs> So Daughters of Cain are a relatively small faction in the scheme of things. They've got quite a low model count to be fair. And they mainly consist of mostly the Witch Elves from the old Warhammer Fantasy range. With a few new units have been added over time and during the end times as well. And obviously they have their own god now in the form of Marathi. So they're battle traits. So once per battle, any combat phase, you can pay one CP to do this. Declare, pick a friendly Daughters of Cain infantry unit that is in combat to use this ability. That unit can use two fight abilities this phase. After the first is used, this unit has strikes last for the return. So basically, for one CP, you can turn your infantry into Varring Guard, so you're going to get to fight twice, which is pretty strong. Now, do bear in mind that you are going to be striking last for your second fight ability, which means that if you don't do enough damage on the first round, you're going to take uh, at least... Um, a kick in on the way back and you know you are an elf you're not massively heavily armored so you know pick the right unit you know you could even this could be perfect for taking out a large um, horde unit and with a, a more elite unit but you do have a passive ability which does get better over time so um, a different effect applies to the friendly daughters of cane units each battle round as shown below the effects are all from the previous battle rounds are also applied to this. So basically, every battle round as you progress through from turn 1 to turn 5, your army increasingly gets better and better and better and more powerful as these buffs stack. So in battle round 1, you get add 1 to run rolls for, uh, for these units. That's really good. In second battle round, you add 1 to charge rolls for these units. So plus 1 to run, plus 1 to charge by turn 2. It's pretty decent. By turn 3... You add one to hit rolls for this unit in combat. Plus one to hit is always nice. Then obviously in turn four, you get plus one to wound, which is amazing. And then finally in turn five, you add one to the attack characteristics of this unit's melee weapon profiles. Which means that in most cases, by turn five, you're going to be plus one to attack, plus one to hit, plus one to wound. And that's going to be pretty solid leading you into the final throws of the game when most armies have taken a severe amount of casualties. So next up we have the most all important page which is the battle formations which as I say in every video is basically going to dictate how you build your army and they'll probably be themed around certain aspects of the Daughters of Cain. So the first one is you've got Scathe Coven. If the unmodified charge rolls for a friendly Medusae or Canari unit is an 8+, plus, that unit has to strike first for the rest of the turn. That's pretty cool. Um, you're probably going to be taking a lot of Medusae because they're pretty good. Shadow Patrol, pick a friendly Daughters of Cade infantry unit that is not uh, in combat to use this ability. Roll a dice on a 3+, plus, remove the unit from the battlefield, and set it up again on the battlefield more than 9 inches from all enemy units. So, having an inbuilt teleport in your army, again, is extremely strong, especially in more um, deep objective-driven uh, battle plans like Border Patrol and stuff like that. This is also really sort of, if your opponent knows that you've got this, like I say all the time, the, you know, they're going to be a little bit more cagey with coming forward. They have to keep units in the backfield. They can't commit everything. So close combat armies like Korn can't go absolute balls deep on you, which is how they like to play. Um, and they're going to have to keep something at the back. And this is where you're able to jump in and ninja those backfield objectives. So it's pretty, that, was pretty, that would be pretty strong, especially if that's, you've got a nice combat unit to do that. And it's only on a 3 plus as well, so which is pretty decent. And it's every movement phase. Next one is the Cauldron Guard. So this is a once per turn army at the end of your turn. Pick up the three friendly Daughters of Cain infantry units or war machines. Units that are in that are in combat with, uh, to be the effect. For each target, make a piling move. Then pick an enemy unit in the combat with the target and roll a D3. And on a 2+, plus inflict equal amounts of mortal damage. That's kind of cool. Uh, the Seraphon have a similar rule as well, which I always seem to forget doing. But... Yeah, it's not bad, and if you're getting into combat with a big sort of um, god-level monster like Nagash, it's a nice way of putting a little bit of extra hurt onto him before the next round. And um, it's on any turn, so which is pretty good. And then you've got the Slaughter Troop, uh, so basically change one of the dice in the charge roll to a 4+. plus. 
Um, that's okay. Um, you know, you, you're gonna if you roll low, you, you're gonna guarantee maybe an eight charge, maybe a nine. Um, but it's only once per turn, and you, if the re you, reaction is you declare the charge ability for a friendly doors of cane unit. Um, and you can only do it in one unit, so it kind of saves you spending a CP on the reroll. But yeah, uh, for me, I think the top two are the sort of two strongest ones. Um, getting that strike first with your Medusa units is pretty good, and having a teleport in your bag is always a strong option. Next, you've got your hero traits and your artifacts of power. These are obviously things that we're going to give to non unique heroes. So, for your hero traits at the start, you've got end of any turn, master of poisons. So, pick an enemy unit that had any damage points allocated to it this turn by this unit's combat attacks to be the target. For the rest of the battle, that's huge. The target cannot be healed. Oh, amazing. And the slain models can be. Re cannot be returned to the target unit that is so strong like you could literally just shut down um armies that rely on heals so undead have a lot of heals in there especially the vampires um some set elements of like seraphon can have a heal with like the heal at the end of um with the artifact and the hero trait cities of sigmar have got a heal they just heal d3 models with a certain artifact um, for infantry units within range of that hero, you can literally turn that off. Um, that is really quite solid as well. And there's no dice roll. You've just you just got to cause damage to them, and then they're they're screwed. And you only need to do it once because it's for the rest of the battle. Then we've got bathed in blood at the end of any turn. Heal three to this unit in um, if it is in combat. It's really nice self heal there. And then the last you've got the zealous orinator. If the friendly unit is wholly within twelve inches of this unit uses a rally command you can make three additional rolls so rather than using six dice you've got to use nine which guarantees a little a few more of those four pluses that you're going to need which is kind of cool so the artifacts of power once per battle your hero phase pick a friendly daughters of cane priest holy within 12 inches of this unit and give that unit d6 ritual points um this is only once per battle though and if you've got like a priest that is going to be the one that's going to be pumping out your manifestations um doing this Personally, I would do this turn one to get that D6 ritual point straight away before they even start rolling for it. And it just means that you might be able to get something out quite early on in the game. Then we've got a movement phase one, once per battle, uh, sever severfold shadow. If this unit is not in combat, remove it from the battlefield and set it up again on the battlefield more than nine inches from all enemy units. Yeah, it's another, it's another teleport, um, but it's on a hero. Um, you could tie this in with your battle formation, so you've got basically two. You can send a nice buffed up unit from one side of the ball to the other, and also drop a unit, uh, a hero in there with them to give them a little bit of support. Um, so yeah, that could be definitely a, a play that you could do. Then passive, crown of war, subtract two from control scores of enemy units while they're only within nine inches of this unit. That's always nice to, to mess around with control scores. Me, I really like the, um, the pendant for the D6 ritual points. I think that's really, really good. And if you're going to be leaning into that teleport, having a hero that can teleport with that unit is always going to be strong. So as you expect, elves have spells because they're magic-y and pointed ears. So they've got three of them and they're pretty much decent casts. So the first one is uh, Steed of Shadows. Pick a friendly Daughters of Cain wizard to be to cast a spell. Pick a visible friendly Daughters of Cain unit, holy within 12, and then roll a D, 2d6, casting on a 5. The target can use charge abilities this turn, even if it run. Given the unit run and charge, and it's an unlimited spell, which means obviously multiple run and charges as long as if it's multiple wizards doing it you're perfectly fine and then different units being targeted couple this in with your battle trait where you're going to get plus one to your run rolls and then by turn two plus one to your charge rolls this is incredibly strong and you're probably going to do this spell a lot next you've got doomfire pick a friendly daughters of kin wizard to cast this spell pick a visible enemy unit within 12 inches of them to be the target and then make a casting roll of 2d6 needing a seven if the target has fewer than 10 models, inflict D3 mortal damage on the target. Cool. If the target has 10 to 19 models, inflict D6 uh, mortal damage on the target. And if the target has 20 or more models, inflict a flat 6 damage on the target. Um, this is pretty good, and it's going to be kind of nice against horde units. You know, if you're coming up against Skaven, you're going to probably see units of 20 clan rats. Um... The fact that there's no reinforcement points anymore and every unit can be reinforced depending on the points. 
you're probably going to see clan rats being um, run at 20. So this is a nice way of just getting six, getting rid of six of them straight away. And then, you know, as they, as they drop down through, you're going to do less damage. So you've got Mind Razor as your last spell, casting on an 8. Pick a friendly Daughters of Cain Wizard to cast the spell. Pick a friendly Visible Unit within, hold you within 12. Add one to the ring characteristics of the target your melee weapons until the, the start of your next turn. In addition, if the target charges turn, add one to the damage characteristics of this unit's melee weapons to the start of the next turn. That's kind of cool because, you, you know, your battle traits are basically giving you plus one hit, plus one to win, plus one attack. And this spell is then filling in the rest of the line by giving you an extra rend and an extra damage. So definitely at the end of, you know, near the back end of the game, turn four, turn five, this is definitely a, a nice little spell to put onto a unit to really sort of drive home all of those buffs. Doors of Cain have a lot of priests because they, well, they're priestesses, I suppose. So... The first one is Sacrament of Blood. So you pick a friendly Daughters of Cain priest to chant this prayer. Pick a visible Daughters of Cain unit holy within 12 and do a chanting roll. Now this is needing 5 chant points and you obviously roll a d6 and you need a 5 plus straight away. But you know, you do have a hero with an artifact that can give you literally d6 chanting points straight off the start. And then till, till, till the start of your next turn, add 1 to the current battle roll. Battle round number when determining which effects of the Blood Rites ability apply to the target. If the chanting roll was a 10+, plus, that until the start of your next turn, treat the current battle round as round 5 when determining which effect of the Blood Rites ability to the target. So basically what this means is, you, if you get this off, if you're in battle round 1 and you get this off on a unit, basically that unit will have plus 1 to the run, plus 1 to the charge. If you roll a 10 plus, which is where the artifact is going to come really into play, because you're going to be able to potentially get that six um, ritual points off the bat, and then on your D6 on the top, you could basically be sitting there looking at at least 12, and you only need five or at least 10 for this big power. You can get all five of your battle rights, blood rights straight away, which means you're getting pl plus one to run, plus one to charge, plus one to hit, wound, and plus one attack. Couple that in with the spell that allows you to run and charge. You could basically send that unit up the board and just go bonkers into the front line, clearing out a screen and then allowing your more bigger units to come in and really wreck some stuff. So yeah, that's pretty good. Your hero phase, mark a sacrifice. So pick a friendly daughter's of cane priest. You do a chanting roll uh, on the, on a, and then you pick a daughter's of cane unit holy within 12 inches of them. You need a four for this. So it's pretty doable. Until the start of your next turn, <clears throat> each time a model in the target unit is slain by a combat attack before removing it from play, pick an enemy unit that's in combat and roll the dice. If the chanting roll was an 8+, plus, roll 2 dice instead of 1, and for each 5+, plus, inflict a mortal damage. So basically, you, you, you get a model killed, you're going to be doing a mortal damage on a 5+, plus back to the enemy unit once the combat have been resolved. That's okay. Other units have that baked into their war scrolls already. Your hero phase, Covenant of the Iron Heart. So pick a friendly Daughters of Cain Priest, do chanting roll, pick a friendly unit within 12, and ignore negative modifiers on the target's control score until the start of your next turn. In addition, if the chanting roll was an 8+, plus, add 5 to the target's control score until the start of your turn. This could be kind of good, especially if you're going to be doing that little trick with dropping a unit into the backfield to take an objective. You could send a Priest with a nice big unit, Hold on the home objective, which potentially could score you four points, using Border War as an example. And then you put this prayer onto that unit and give them plus five to their combat score, really making sure that you're not going to lose it to any counter charge or anything like that. So yeah, some nice little play there. So we have some manifestations. They're more like prayers. So basically, um, you're going to... They've got their own set. So the Bill Wind is essentially cast on a six and set up within nine of the caster and more than nine wins from all visible enemy units the blood rack viper is again set up within nine of the caster and more than nine from all visible units and that's cast on a six and then the heart the summon heart of fury that is set up within nine inches of the caster visible to them and that is chanted on a five plus so we'll go through the war scrolls for the manifestations now. 
So the Blood Rock Viper is the first of the manifestations for the Daughters of Cain. It is obviously an end of spell. It's got a six up ward. It's got a four up save. It moves nine. It's got a health of ten. You banish it on a seven plus. And it's got fang strikes, which is three attacks. Four to hit, two to wound, minus one rend, three damage. Anti-hero plus one rend. And it does crits mortals on sixes to hit. It's basically a big scary blood snake, which is kind of cool. So it's got crushing coils. So pick an enemy infantry hero in combat with this manifestation to be the target. Roll a dice on a three plus. The target has strike last. It's kind of cool, but like a lot of manifestations, you know, you're kind of wanting this to target an infantry hero, but you're really not going to get that unless they really position it badly. So you're probably going to use this as a nice little screen unit. Um, it can do some reasonably decent damage into a unit. So maybe, you know, have this supporting an infantry unit going in. Um, a big giant blood snake and a load of blood stalkers would be kind of cool. Um, but yeah, it's it's a, it's a manifestation, so it's going to be relatively easy to get rid of. But you're also going to be bringing it back as soon as you've killed it anyway. Next, we have Blade Wind, which is again in the spell. It flies. It's got a six up ward, a six up save. It moves twelve, which is pretty fast. Health of seven and a banishment of a seven plus, and it's bladed vortex. So it's got nine attacks, hitting on threes, wounding on threes, minus one rend, one damage, crit two hits. And then in any combat phase, if this manifestation charged this turn, pick an enemy unit in combat with it to be the, not the target, roll a D3, and on a 3+, plus, ignore positive modifiers to save rolls for the target for the rest of the turn. Which basically means no um, all-out defense on them. But 9 attacks hitting on 3s, it's a bit of a blender. It's not doing massive amounts of damage per hit, but you know it's a nice supporting roll. And again, it's also, if you get this in the right position... It can basically be a nice little screen as well. Because you're not really wanting to get anywhere near this. Um, but it's really kind of handy as well if you want to shut down um, command points for potential all-out defences. Throw this in. Roll a 3+. plus. They ain't going to get to do it anymore. And then you're really sort of like beated with a buffed up unit of one of your witch elves and stuff like that. And lastly we've got the Heart of Fury which is a invocation. So this is the prayer one. Um, it has a 6 up ward and it's got no movement but it's got a 4 up save, a health of 7 and a banishment of 7 and it's it's basically a locus of the murder god so you sub subtract 1 from rune rolls from combat attacks that target friendly daughters of cane infantry units while they hold you within 12 inches of this manifestation basically what you want to do is you want to set up a nice big solid line and, um, and your, your battle line in basically the middle of the board Get one of your priests to drop this down and then anything that's holy within 12 are going to be minus one to wound you. This is seriously strong and your your opponents are either going to be trying to shoot this off the board or they're going to really going to be trying to banish it. And if they're banishing it, it means that they're giving up one of their, their, their casts to get rid of it. Um, so it's pretty decent and it, out of all of the three of them, you're probably going to use this the most. But... You also have access to all of the other manifestations, and let's be fair, Moby Conjurations is just way too strong, um, and probably way better anyway, so I would probably use that over these ones. So the first of the big war scrolls we have is Marathi herself, which is now a god-level character. She achieved godhood, and it's a pretty interesting unit in regards to there's two models for her. So before, at the very beginning when this model come out, she would start off as her little sort of elf self. And as she took so much damage, she would eventually turn into the big scary monster and do stuff. Now, they're essentially two separate models, but you can't wound more than three damage per turn onto them. They're a bit weird, um, and but they are pretty cool in regards to how they do stuff so marathi of cain this is the caster this is the little elf version she's basically a three class wizard um war physician war master unique and hero and she has a ward save of six plus she has a save of five plus she moves six she has two six health and control of two she has heart render and bladed wings so that's five attacks threes because she's an elf force to wound twos to rend two damage no abilities so in your hero phase you've got mirror dance so if a friendly Shadow Queen, which is the big one, the Medusa one with the big wings, is on the battlefield, make a casting roll of 2d6. Place two tokens on the battlefield, one directly underneath the center of this base, unit's base, and one directly underneath the center of the friendly Shadow 
Shadow Queen's base, then remove this unit and that of the Shadow Queen, and then set them up again. Basically, this is a lot of words to basically say that this spell switches the two models around. All right, and the tokens on the table are basically just so you know where they two go. So this is really for if you've positioned little Marathi in the wrong place and she's about to get charged or a lot of the enemy are coming bearing down on her, you can quickly do a little bit of shenanigans, cast this spell, teleport her out the way to the back or the other side of the field where she's not needed and a little bit more safer and you put the big shadow queen in there in place which is kind of a monster and something that you don't really want to be fighting too much because she's a bit of a bee stick. So her next passive ability is one soul two bodies so each time a damage point would be allocated to this unit it is instead allocated to the friendly shadow queen so the big one you cannot make any further ward rolls for that damage all right so you know you get damage on it you get damage on it if this unit would be automatically destroyed by another ability i.e hand of dust it is not automatically destroyed instead allocate three damage points to a friendly shadow queen ward rules can still cannot be made for this damage point if a friendly shadow queen is destroyed this unit is automatically destroyed all right so the the key to killing her is basically ignore the little one and just target the big one um, and the big one is the scarier of the two to be fair so she has a passive supreme sorcerer supreme so you add one to the casting rolls for this unit's um, spells which is surprising because you know she's a really crazy big witch elf wizard priest god thing now the shadow queen part so this is a unique it's a hero it's a monster and it has a six up war save and the points for all of this and this is bear in mind this is both of them um she comes in at good question where is she She's 760 points, which is quite a lot. Um, so she's she's more expensive than Teclas. So she has a four up save, or at least this one does. This one moves 12 inches. It has 12 health and a control of 10. Now she has the gaze of the Shadow Queen, which is a 12 inch range attack, rolling one dice, hitting on a two, wounding on a two. I can guarantee if you're ever gonna roll a one to hit, it will be on this attack. It rends of three and it does D six damage which means if you if you actually hit with this you're going to roll a one when you do the d6 damage and you can do shoot in combat she has three weapons in close combat she has heart render which is eight attacks threes and threes minus two rend three damage and she also does mortal damage on sixes to hit she has the crown of serpents which is all of her crazy snake hair which is two d6 attacks fours and fours no rend one damage and then she has a big poison tail which is one attack threes and threes two rend six damage right so she's a pretty bit of a combat monster if you go in there and try to kill her and then she has all of her fail safes to keep her alive and this is where it really gets annoying so the iron heart of cain you cannot allocate more than three damage points to this unit each turn once three points have been allocated to this unit in a turn any further damage points that would be allocated to it are ignored damage points allocated to this unit cannot be healed if this unit would be automatically destroyed, it's not automatically destroyed. Instead, allocate three damage points to it. Ward saves can't be made. Now, the, what happens here is if you apply a load of damage to the little version, that transfers over to this one, but you can only ever do three per turn, which means that you're going to at least get to turn two if you do damage turn one and turn so basically the t you've got two turns per round you have two player turns and that's how i'm going to basically read this because it says turn not battle round so you can do three points in your turn you can then do three points of damage in your opponent's turn which means a counter charge and or shooting with a um a shooting attack and then in the following turn in round battle round two you can then do the same and get rid of her she she is a pain in the ass because she is a six up ward and a four up save and you can't really nuke her and get rid of her now even things like archeon 
with his Slayer of Kings is not going to be able to get rid of her straight away and Nagashi's Hand of Dust is not going to be able to get rid of her. So it can be a bit infuriating, but if you do it right and try to get the damage over those to over the battle round, you can get rid of her. But she is going to wreck face while she's still on the table. And you'll also notice as a monster, she doesn't have a damage um, box either. So none of her attacks drop down as she gets damaged. So she just basically stays the same. And I would believe blood rights will also affect her as well. So, Fury of the Shadow Queen, pick an enemy unit in combat with this unit to be the target, roll a d3 on a 2+, plus. inflict mortal damage on the target equal to the roll. If the model, if any models are slain by this ability, for the rest of the turn, add one attack characteristic to the to melee weapons by friendly Kanarai units and Medusa units while they're wholly within 12 inches of, of this unit. That's a pretty solid thing, especially if you lean into the battle formation, you bring her in and you bring loads of snakes. So the reason why we call this Marathi and the Bull Snakes. Next up we have Karuth Sir the Crone Seer. Games Workshop and their names. Um, she's 190 points and I believe this is the new model that come out with the Dawnbringer campaign. She's obviously unique. She's a hero. She's a priest one and she has a six up ward. She has a five up save because she's basically walking around in a dressing gown. She has a movement of 12 because she does fly because she's got big ass wings. She has six health, two control. She's got the staff of Mor the Morai guy, Hag. So it's four attacks, threes followed by fours, one rend, d3 damage. And she has a load of rules. So she's got the, the burnt offerings. So if this unit is within combat range of a friendly cauldron of blood, pick a friendly um, daughter's of Cain Aleph unit, non hero infantry unit to be wholly within 18 inches to beat the target. And then effect, you roll a dice and pick one of the effects. So first effect. Until the start of your next battle round, enemy units cannot use command points while in combat range without target. That's pretty strong. Next one, the target can use non-move ability as if it were your movement phase. That unit counts as having used a run ability this turn. Pretty cool. For the rest of the turn, while that target is contesting an objective, subtract 10 from the control scores of enemy units uh, contesting that objective that do not have a hero or the monster keyword. Minus 10 to your control score is huge. And next, she has a, um, a prayer, so Murder of the Crows. Pick a visible enemy unit within 18 inches of this unit to be a target, and then make a chanting roll of two, uh, a d6. On, a, on roll a d3, if the chanting roll was an 8+, plus, roll a d6 instead. Inflict an amount of mortal damage on the target equal to the roll. In addition, if the roll exceeds the target's health characteristics, subtract one from hit rolls for the target unit until the start of your next turn. So she's pretty decent, and she kind of does a lot of buffing, and that's what she's mainly for. Next up, we have the Blood Rack Shrine, which comes in at 240 points, and it's got a six up ward. It's a war machine. It's a hero. It's basically the other version of the Cauldron of the Blood, and it's got a four up save, move six, 12 health, control five, and it's got the Blood Rack Stair. So range of 12, attack one, it hits on a two, and then it's got rules. So the Blood Rack Stair is each time this unit attacks with a Blood Rack Stair, if the, unit, if the attack score so hit, roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in the target. And then for every five plus, inflict one mortal damage on the unit. You cannot pick the same enemy unit to be the target of attacks made with a blood rack stare more than once per phase. So if you've got multiple of these things, they can't all hit the same target. It also shoots in combat, which is kind of handy. And then it's got in a close combat attacks, which are not great. So it's got five attacks, threes and fours, minus one rent two damage. And then it's got its horses do six attacks, threes and fours. Minus one rend, one damage. It's not even horses, it's, it's keepers with its sticks. Has two abilities, so your hero phase, pick up the three different enemy units within nine inches of this unit. On a D3, inflict equal, on two plus, inflict equal amounts of mortal damage to the roll. And then any charge phase, blade of impact. If this unit charges phase, pick an enemy unit within one inch of it to be the target. And then again, roll a D3 on a two plus, inflict equal amounts of mortal damage on the roll. Yeah, not bad. Next up, we have the Iron Skill. I believe she is one of the new heroes, uh, or one of the newer heroes, and she is 160 points. She is obviously um, ward up of six up, and she is a five up save because she's a semi-naked snake lady. She moves eight because she's a snake lady, and she has six health and two controls. She has her really big stick that fires stuff at you for a range of 12, two attacks, threes and threes, minus one rend, 
d3 damage no abilities and then she also hits you in combat with the big stick with six attacks threes followed by fours one rend two damage crit mortals on sixes to hit which is kind of cool she's a really cool looking model as you can see and she has two abilities so you can you declare the fight ability for this unit so this is where she's going to kind of do the whole chaos lord thing with chaos warriors so you pick a, a friendly non-hero Medusa Medusa unit that has not used the fight ability. Basically, the snakes with either the bows or the spears. Um, that is within this unit's combat range to be the target. That target can use a fight ability immediately after the fight ability used by this unit has been resolved. If it is picked to do so, add one to the attack characteristics of the target's melee weapons. So you kind of kind of want her rolling around with your, your spear Medusa units getting her into combat, having a fight with her first, and then immediately attacking with the other unit as well. It's kind of cool, and it, a lot of heroes do this, and it's kind of, it's a, I like this a little mechanic, because it, it encourages you to bring these heroes along with these units, which is kind of cool. Then you've got Wrath of the Sc uh, Scathborn, so you can reroll charge rolls for friendly Medusa units while you're holding within 12 inches. You know, You've already got one ability that busts them. You're, you're definitely going to want to bring in Medusa because you're both going to be re-rolling charges, which is really, really solid. Next, you've got the Hag Queen on a Cauldron of Blood. So the Hag Queen on the Cauldron of Blood is 350 points. Um, you used to get these in the old starter set, so I'm not too sure if they're sold separately now. Um, but she's a War Machine. She's also a Priest 1. She's got a 4-up save, a Ward of 6. Move 6 because they're pretty slow but they got 12 health and a control of five so you've got the torrent of burning blood so they boil a load of blood at you and then chuck it at you and it's got a range of 10 six attacks threes and threes minus one rend one damage shoot into combat and then they got a couple of attacks so the blade of cane is four attacks four threes and fours minus one rend two damage crit mortals which is quite nice the avatar sword which is five attacks threes and threes minus two rend three damage which is pretty decent and then they got the, the Witch Elves with their little pointy sticks, which is six attacks, threes and fours, no rend, one damage. So some decent amount of damage comes out of there, mainly coming from the Avatar. So passive. So at the end, add one to save rolls for friendly Daughters of Cain infantry units while they're wholly within nine inches of this unit. And then add one to the chanting rolls for friendly priests while they're wholly within nine inches of this unit. Pretty good, because, you know, it's Cain, they worship Cain. It makes sense. So any charge phase, uh, bladed impact. So if this unit charged, uh, pick a unit within one inch, and then you do usual, roll a d3 on a two plus, inflict equal amounts of mortal damage. You're pretty much used to that rule now because it's it's a standard rule now across the game. So once per turn, army in any hero phase, pick a friendly daughter's a cane unit, that hold you within 12 inches of this unit to the target, and roll a dice on a three plus, that's good. The target has a five up ward for the rest of the turn. Um, that's pretty solid. So you pick a unit, holy within 12, um, and give them a ward save on a 3+. plus. That's really, really quite nice as well. Uh, although they are quite expensive, and but if you're an existing Daughters of Cain player, you're probably going to have a few Daughters of Hag Queens on a Cauldron of Blood because they were pretty much, you know, how most of your hero units came um, because you bought one model and then all of the bits kind of give you all your heroes. So you probably got a couple. For new players, I would probably pick up one for your collection because the you never know, one might come in handy. Next, you've got the Blood Rat Medusa. So this is the spare Medusa model if you're not if you're building it in a certain way. And this is going to come in at Blood Rat Medusa. 180 points. So she's obviously a hero, a wizard one, and a ward of six plus. Five up save. She's pretty much a semi-naked medusa lady so not much armor on there she moves eight giant snakes and a health of six and control of two she has the blood rack stare which again is just like the other version um that we've got you 12 inch range one attack hit on twos and then you do the whole pick a unit roll a dice for each model five plus inflict a mortal damage can't do this more than once to the same unit she has a spear attacks five attacks threes and fours minus one rent two damage and then she has reaction you declared a fight ability f with this unit so pick a friendly non-hero medusa unit that is not used a fight ability this turn um that is within combat range then do the fight and then you can immediately resolve personally for 180 points for this model right i would take the iron skill for 20 points less 
and it does a better version of um, the 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 buff to Medusa units because you're also getting the plus one attack as well with the the iron scales. So, but the blood rat Medusa is basically comes from a kit and it's kind of like a spare model that they give rules to because they kind of needed to flesh this unit out with heroes and, and units and stuff back in the the day when they first sort of added them into the game. So I, I, I can see these disappearing at some point in the future. Um, but yeah, it's for, for like 20 points less, I'd, I'd take the Iron Scale rather than bring this. Next, we get the Hag Queen on foot. And the Hag Queen comes in at 140 points. She's uh, a priest and she's got a 6-up save. 5-up, 6-up ward, 5-up save, move 6, 5 health to control. She's got the Blade of Cain um, and she has 4 attacks, 3s and 4s, minus 1 rend 2 damage doing crits on mortals so pick a friendly daughters of cane unit wholly within 12 inches of this unit to be the target and then roll a dice on a three plus the target has a five up ward for the rest of the turn i'm not too sure if this model is sold in a blister or if it's one of the models that comes with the cauldron of blood like if you know like drop a comment in the in below uh, and let us all know i'm i'm unsure I'm pretty sure that this is a, a separate model sold separately and not a part of the Paul Dunder Blood Kit. Um, I think. I think. I'm not too sure. But either way, you're probably going to want a one or two Hag Queens because they're relatively cheap and they are priests and they are heroes and you'll be able to do your stuff. So like that thing with teleporting a unit into the backfield and bringing a priest with them, she's the kind of priest that you could do that with because she's pretty cheap to do it and you know she'll be able to do the whole buffing of that unit so you might want a few of these next up we have the avatar of kane not to be confused with the really cool avatar of kane from warhammer 40k this is just another car of kane doing the crucifix motif um from the blood cauldron kit so the avatar of kane is 190 points so it's a monster and it has a six up ward I really wish they, they would do a proper model for this rather than just using a piece of one existing model that you've not used and then gluing it to a base. It's a three up save, which is pretty decent for this army. A, a movement of six, seven health, control of two. It has the torrent of the burning blood. As you can imagine, it's exactly the same as the, the cauldron. So range 10, six attacks, threes and threes, minus one rend, one damage, can shoot in combat. And then it has the sword, which again, is exactly the same from the one where it is on the cauldron. Um, or on the shrine five attacks threes and threes two ren three damage so you've got once per turn army any charge phase if this unit charges this turn pick an enemy unit within one inch of it roll a d3 on a two plus inflict equal amounts of damage if the target was a monster double the amount of damage which is kind of cool it is reasonably decent and it's it's only 190 points which is, means it's dirt cheap for what it is but it's yeah like this faction definitely needs a proper model for this and a really upskilled war scroll on par with like a cow from the Lumineth or a tree lord like a Durthu from the Sylvaneth. This faction definitely needs that. And big, gnarly, Age of Sigma Avatar of Cain is what's needed. You know, a, a fantasy version of the 40k Avatar of Cain because they are essentially the same thing. So continuing the trend of looking at the Cauldron of Blood units, we're looking at the Slaughter Queen on a Cauldron of Blood. And the Slaughter Queen on the Cauldron of Blood comes in at 350 points. Again, it's a Priest 1, it's a War Machine, 6 up save. Uh, 6 up ward, 4 up save, movement 6, health of 12, and a control of 5. Again, Torrent of Blood, exactly the same. And then she has a lot of melee attacks. So basically, this is the same as the other one, but you've kind of changed the hero on it. So this is the one with the Slaughter Queen on it, and then there's another one where you've got the hag queen so they're basically the same units same attack profile and everything else you're just changing the hero that's on it so this one's a priest so passive it has the altar of cain so again you're adding one to save rolls for daughters of cain units and plus one to the chanting rolls because you've got the altar of cain then once per turn army in any combat phase you've got the orgy of slaughter so pick a friendly of daughters of cain elf units infantry wholly within 12 inches Roll a, d uh, roll a d3, sorry, roll a d6 on a 3 plus, add 1 to the attack characteristic. So that's one reason why you're going to take her. Plus 1 attack is really good. 
and then any charge and then you got the impact so you're going to be picking a unit within one inch after you're charged and any charge so this also includes counter charge then roll a d3 and inflict equal amounts of mortal damage on a two plus so yep yeah, again it's really depends on how you built it and what you want it to do because you're basically just switching out the two heroes and they're exactly the same amount of points and they do almost the same things but one or two of the rules may be slightly different and speaking of the slaughter queen here is the slaughter queen if you don't glue it to the the cauldron of blood you can basically glue it to a normal base and have her running around on the battlefield on her own and she comes in at 150 points on her own and as surprise surprise she's a priest one she's a ward up a six plus she has a save of five movement of six health of five and a control of two and then all of her rules were exactly the same as the one with her on the war machine there is no real difference her attack profile is the same and she does the little once per turn in any combat phase um, with giving plus one attack to friendly infantry units. So no real difference there. And you'll see a lot of things like this in this army because this army definitely needs a natural injection of a, a new wave of actual units and heroes. Next, we've got the High Gladiatrix, one of the newer heroes for the faction. And she's 130 points. She's an infantry hero with a six up ward a five up save a movement of six a health of five and a control of two she's got a whip and a gladiator sword so she's got six attacks threes and fours minus one rend two damage and then she's got a couple of root cool rules so she's got paragon of slaughter so if this unit is in combat pick a friend visible friendly daughters of kid alf you non hero infantry unit that's a lot of words for basically pick it an elf unit a friendly unit within 12 inches that's not a hero okay Roll the dice on a 2+, plus, add 1 to the, the rend characteristics of melee weapons used by the target for the rest of the turn. Plus 1 rend is kind of cool because you're getting plus to hit, wound, attacks, and run and charge. All from your 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 battle traits. So getting that nice plus 1 rend is also kind of cool. And then she has once per battle in any combat phase. Pick an enemy hero in combat with this target. Roll 2d6. If the roll exceeds the target's health characteristic, it is automatically destroyed. That is nuts. So basically, you come up to in combat with any enemy hero and have a health characteristic of at least 10 or less, there's a good chance that you're going to clean that out. So a mega boss on foot, you're going to kill. Most foot heroes are going to be able to be killed on this. You're not going to run up to Angron and kill him because you can't roll more than 18 or 20 or 25 on 2d6. So, you know, you can still run up and have a smack at him, but you're not going to try to one-shot him. All right, so we got the Doomfire Warlocks, I believe the only male unit in the entire faction. They're wizards, so they're a wizard one cavalry unit of five models with a five, a six up ward save, and they've got 150 points. They've got a five up save, movement of 14, a health of three, which is pretty decent, uh, a control of one, and then they've got the crossbows, which is a range of 10, two attacks, threes and fours, no rend, one damage, no abilities. And then they caught the Cursed Scimitars, two attacks, threes and fours, one rend, one damage. And then the Horsies, I've got a Horsey profile. So they've got a passive ability. So when this unit uses the redeploy command, if you roll a one and three, determining the distance, this unit can move and use a value of four instead. Now, they are a wizard one, and there's very few units that are not heroes that are wizards. Like, Lumineth Realm Lords used to pretty much be all this, all of wizards. Um these aren't and i believe there are faqs out there from tournaments that there are just the faq in it that it's the unit champion that's the wizard not the guys and that if the unit <clears throat> if the unit champion gets killed then you you lose the wizard keyword or stuff like that but i think that's kind of how people are playing it but yeah they're a bit weird um they're definitely a holdover from the old fantasy battle days i can expect to see these disappearing at some point in the near future um, especially over the next few editions, um, for more sort of AOS-themed units. But yeah, um, it's an old unit. They're all right. Next, you've got the Sisters of Slaughter with Sacrificial Knives. And the Sister Sword of Slaughter um, is 10 models for 130 points. They're basically witch elves with masks and knives. Um They've got a 6-up ward, which is standard across the army. A 6-up save, movement 6, 1 health, 1 control. And then they've got 3 attacks each. 3s followed by 4s, no rend, 1 damage. Anti-infantry plus 1 rend, which is kind of cool. 
So this unit can move three inches, it can pass through the combat ranges of enemy units and can end that move in combat and you can do this at the enemy combat phases. So you kind of get another three inch pylon, which is kind of good, which is not too bad. Next we get the Sisters of Slaughter, again, but this time with a different loadout of weapons with the bladed bucklers. So they're basically like big whips with blades on them. Um, they've got a six up ward and they have a five up save. These come in at 10 point, uh, sorry, models 10 unit size for 110 points. They are so cheap. And they've got a five up save, they've got a move at six, health of one, control of one, and they've got two attacks each, threes followed by fours, one rend, one damage, anti-infantry plus one rend. So basically you've got two versions of the same unit, both with anti-infantry, so it really depends on which one you like and which of the two sort of rules you, you like. The other one gives plus one rend, oh no it doesn't, the other one does the little weird three inch move, and this one has two passive abilities. So this one subtracts one from hit rolls for the combat target in this uh, this unit, that's really strong. And then the other one is each time you make a, an unmodified roll of a six for a combat attack that targets this unit, inflict one mortal damage on the attacking unit after the fight has been resolved. So you do mortal damage back if they hit you on a six, or they get a six on save. I Personally, for 20 points cheaper, I would take these ones because they're better in all ways. Next we get Witch Elves with bladed buckles and Witch Elves with these are 110 points. In fact, both types of units of Witch Elves are 110 points. Um, six up ward, five save, move six, health one, control one, two attacks each, threes followed by fours, minus one rend, one damage, crit damage, uh, crit auto wounding, which is pretty good. And then each time you make an unmodified save roll of a six for a combat attack that target this unit, inflict one mortal damage on the target until the fight ability has been resolved. Pretty cool. Pretty cheap as well for 110 points for 10 models, so that's kind of nice. Then the other version of the Witch Elves, and these are Witch Elves with the paired um, knives. Again, 110 points, six up ward, six save, move six, health one, control one. You got your knives, got three attacks each. Threes followed by fours. You've got to remember that over the course of the battle, that is getting better. Minus one rend, one damage, crit auto uh, wounds. Then you've got frenzy. So, uh, and to be fair, this is probably what you're going to pick. You're going to take these over the others. So add one to the rend characteristics of the unit's uh, melee weapons for the rest of the turn if this unit charged in this turn. Hell yes. So you're going to be able to get plus one attacks. So you're going to be hitting on twos. You're going to be able to wound on threes. You're, there, is, there is other ways of getting additional rend into this unit, so you potentially have rend 2 on the charge, and you're hit auto wounding on 6s to hit. Yeah, and they're dirt cheap at 110 points for 10. You're going to take Witch Elf units um, with, their little, with their little daggers, plus the, the classic archetype. Then we've got the Bloodstalkers, which are 140 points for 5. Now we're moving into the units that are um, pretty much common in the competitive scene at least because the snakes are the stronger part of the army. As a six up ward, uh, save of five, movement of eight, which is really fast, health of two, control of one. You got your bows, which are 18 inches, all shooting has been reduced now. Three attacks, threes followed by fours, minus one rend, one damage, crit auto wounding, so jealous as a city's player. And then you've got your little sword, which is two attacks, threes followed by fours, no rend, one damage. And you have a shooting of phase ability, heart seekers. So if this unit did not use a move ability this turn and was not set up this turn, so you're not doing any of your deep striking teleport stuff, this unit's shooting attacks score critical hits on unmodified five pluses for the rest of the turn. You're almost like sentinels, basically, um, but you get all of your buffs because you are a Medusa unit that all of your Medusa unit heroes and Marathi can do to you. So, yeah, you're gonna, you're probably gonna lean into the Snake Lady part of this army. Next up, we have the Heart Renders, the unit that was a bane in everyone's existence in third edition because it basically was an auto battle tactic just to bring them. They're 110 points for five models. They've got, they fly and they've got a six award. They got a health uh, save of five, movement of 12, health of two, control of one. They've got javelins. 12 inch attack for two attacks threes and fours minus one wind one damage crit or order wounds and then they can fight with the javelins in combat with one attack they're mainly more of a range unit rather than an actual close combat unit so the deployment phase um you can pick this unit has not been deployed you can set it up in the sky so as you've got a, a deep strike unit there as well 
And, and then obviously, you can, as you can tell, in your movement phase, you can deploy them anywhere on the battlefield more than nine inches from all enemy units. This is kind of what they did in third edition, and there was a battle tactic tied into that. So in the shooting phase, if this unit uses a shoot ability, this phase, this unit can move D6. If the if it cannot move into combat in any part of that move. So you shoot, once you finish shooting, you run away D6. That's kind of nice. Um, and it gives you a little bit of um, board control and movement around as well. So pretty decent. So still for 110 points, not bad. Okay, now we've got the Blood Sisters, one of my favourite units in the whole range. Basically, Snake Ladies with big spears. And they come in at 140 points for five models. They've got a six up ward, a five up save, they move eight, got health of two, control one. And then they've got the big glaives, which they've got two attacks each, hitting on fours, wound on threes, minus one rend, two damage. And they do crit da um, mortal damage on sixes to hit. So they've got any combat phase ability, so pick any, an enemy unit in combat with this unit to be the target. Roll a dice if the unit exceeds the target's health characteristics, the target strikes last. That is so good. Um, you're going to be putting these into enemy units most of the time, so you're probably going to be able to roll higher than a 1 you know, on that D6, and you're just going to be getting them strike last. This is so, so strong, and, and coupled with the amount of buffs that you can give these units... They're really scary. Um, and they're really fast as well when you're thinking about it with an 8-inch move. Okay, so another unit of crazy flying bat ladies. And this is the Canary Life Stalkers. And they come in at 100 points for 5. Again, they fly. They've got a 6 on ward. They've got a 5 health, a movement of 12, health of 2, and control 1. They've got the Blood Sickles. So they're the, kind of the close combat version of the other ones with the Javelins. They've got 2 attacks. 3s, 4s, minus 1 rend, 1 damage, crit order wounds, and then they've got the deployment phase, which you can keep them in the sky and then deploy them in the movement phase later on in the t in the game, but they can be anywhere on the battlefield, more than 9 inches from all enemy units, and then they've got reaction, you declare the fight ability with this unit, after resolving the fight effect of that ability with this unit, this unit can immediately move D6, it cannot end its move in combat with any other unit, it was part of already in the combat with at the start of the move, so basically... You charge, you fight, you run away. Um, fight and fade. It's essentially kind of like the Sylvaneth we're doing. Um, incredibly annoying to go against, especially if you roll really high on that D6, because it stops units um, basically being able to pile in and get you. If you set up well, you can kind of jank it with, so you, you're not, you'll be able to roll like a two and still get out of combat. Um, but you essentially need to roll a four to basically stop anybody from being able to pile in and having a fight with you. So a bit janky, but uh, yeah. Now for the Warcry Warband that survived the cull, and these are the Canaanite Shadow Stalkers, and they come in at 110 points for nine models. They've got a six up ward save, a five up save, movement of six, health of one, control of one. They've got missile weapons, which is um, range 10, one attack, threes and threes, minus one rend, one damage. And then they've got their blades, two attacks each, threes and fours, no rend, one damage. They've got a movement ability, so you can remove this unit from the battlefield and set it up again on the battlefield more than nine inches from all enemy units. So again, another teleport in your army that is kind of nice. And for 110 points, really cheap to do. Leaves your battle formation and um, your artifacts and hero traits open to doing other things because you already have that teleport built into the unit. As I thought as a cane, they're a pretty interesting faction. They definitely need a massive update in regards to new units and new heroes because a lot of the stuff that they've got comes from pretty much one kit, which is the Calder and the Blood kit. I think that thing gives out like three or four heroes and then a couple of units. Um, so they definitely need a major sort of update and a good second wave, um, kind of like on par with what they've done with other factions in the past, especially like to the Iron Jaws and stuff like that would be really nice to see but they are pretty solid and um, marathi is really good personally i really like the snake element of the army i think that's probably the strongest side of the army the blood stalkers the medusae and all of that cool stuff they look really cool as well and they've got some really nice heroes to support that plus it gives you a reason to run marathi and her giant snake like visage um so yeah pretty good army and relatively cheap to get into as well because most stuff is in either in the spearhead box or in their little respective units and it's not too bad 
they can get expensive if you're going to start piling down on the witch elves um i do remember when they first come out they were like 35 pound for 10 models which at the time for warhammer fantasy battle was nuts because you needed at least 30 of them in a unit which was about 120 odd pound per unit which was just mental but uh, yeah has times have changed it's not as expensive as that and they're not in the old world anywhere so with them not being in the old world and being legacy there's a good chance that they're going to be around in age of sigmar for quite some time so hopefully we might see hopefully in the future a big update for them because they definitely need it but that's the video if you like what i'm doing please like subscribe share and all that stuff and i will be returning with more deep dives now we're almost halfway through them all so many to do